Welcome everyone. This is the first screencast in our series on in-context learning. This series is a kind of companion to the one that we did on information retrieval. The two series come together to help you with homework two and Bake Off two, which is focused on few shot open domain question answering with frozen retrievers and frozen large language models. To start this series, I thought we would just reflect a bit on the origins of the idea of in-context learning, which is really a story of how NLP got to this strange and exciting and chaotic moment uh, for the field and maybe also for the society more broadly. All credit to the Chomsky bot for bringing us to this moment. I'm only joking. The, the Chomsky bot is a very simple pattern-based language model. It's been around since the 90s, I believe. And with very simple mechanisms, it produces prose that is roughly in the style of the political philosopher and sometime linguist Noam Chomsky. It produces prose that delights and maybe informs us, and the underlying mechanisms are very simple. And I think that's a nice reminder about what all of these large language models might be doing even in the present day. But I'm only joking, although it's only partly a joke. I think when we think about precedence for in-context learning, it is worth mentioning that in the pre-deep learning era, n-gram-based language models, very sparse large language models, were often truly massive. For example, Brantz et al. 2007 used a 300 billion parameter language model trained on 2 trillion tokens of text to help with machine translation. That is a very large and very powerful mechanism with a different character from the large language models of today, but it is nonetheless worth noting that they played an important role in a lot of different fields way back when. I think for in-context learning as we know it now, the earliest paper, as far as I know, is the DECA NLP paper. This is McCann et al. 2018. They do multitask training with task instructions that are natural language questions. And that does seem like the origin of the idea that with freeform natural language instructions, we could essentially end up with artifacts that could do multiple things guided solely by text. And then it's worth noting also that in the GPT paper, Radford et al. 2018, you can find buried in there some tentative proposals to do prompt-based uh, experiments with that model. But the real origins of the ideas, again, as far as I know, are Radford et al. 2019. This is the GPT-2 paper. Uh, and let me just show you some snippets from this paper. It's really inspiring how much they did. They say at the start, we demonstrate language models can perform downstream tasks in a zero-shot setting without any parameter or architecture modification. So there you see this idea of using frozen models, prompting them, and seeing if they will produce interesting behaviors. They looked at a bunch of different tasks. For summarization, they say, to induce summarization behavior, we add the text TLDR after the article and generate 100 tokens. This is mind blowing. I remember when I first heard about this idea, I had such a cognitive bias against in-context learning of this sort being successful that I assumed what they were trying to say to us is that they had trained that token uh, in a task specific way to do summarization and then just kind of given it a colorful name. But no, they really meant it. They simply prompt the model with this token and look at what comes out. For translation, they say we test whether GPT-2 has begun to learn how to translate from one language to another. In order to help it infer that this is the desired task, we condition the language model on a context of example pairs of the format English sentence equals French sentence. And then after a final prompt of English sentence equals, we sample from the model with greedy decoding and use the first generated sentence as the translation. Incredible. And what you see emerging there is this idea of demonstrations, including in the prompt some examples of the behavior that you want as a way of coaxing the model to do what you would like it to do. Here's a similar example. They say similar to translation, the context of the language model is seeded with example question answer pairs which helps the model infer the short answer style of the data set. So that's for QA. And again, they started to see that demonstrations could help the model see what the implicit task instruction was. And they also, in the paper, evaluate a bunch of other things, text completion, Winograd schemas, and reading comprehension, and maybe others. It's a very impressive and thorough exploration, very open about the benefits and limitations of the methods, a very impressive and creative paper. 
that was the beginning of the idea in terms of research. The cultural moment certainly arrives with the GPT-3 paper, Brown et al. 2020, which is also impressive in its own ways. And here I'm just going to quote from the abstract and we can linger a bit over what it says. They start, we show that scaling up language models greatly improves task agnostic few shot performance, sometimes even reaching competitiveness with prior state of the art fine tuning approaches. We could quibble with whether or not they actually saw competitiveness in that sense, but it is absolutely true that they got very impressive behaviors out of their model in this task agnostic few shot setting. Specifically, we train GPT-3, an autoregressive language model with 175 billion parameters, 10x more than any previous non-sparse language model, and test its performance in the few shot setting. There are two things I really like about this part. First, 175 billion parameters is indeed incredibly ambitious and impressive, even today, to say nothing of back in 2020. And I also really love that they mentioned non-sparse language model, a nod to those n-gram-based models that I mentioned before, which were often truly massive. For all tasks, GPT-3 is applied without any gradient updates or fine-tuning, with tasks and few-shot demonstrations specified purely via text interaction with the model. That's nice. You might think in retrospect that they're kind of repeating themselves here. They've already established that these are going to be frozen models, but I think it's necessary for them to do that because this was such an unfamiliar idea. And I can imagine, again, being a reader of this paper and assuming that they can't really mean they're just using frozen models for all these tasks. Surely there is some fine tuning somewhere. And so they're emphasizing that in fact, the model is entirely frozen. GPT-3 achieves strong performance on many NLP datasets, including translation, question answering, and closed tasks, as well as several tasks that require on-the-fly reasoning or domain adaptation, such as unscrambling words, using a novel word in a sentence, or performing three-digit arithmetic. I love this, a real diversity of tasks, and what I think you can see them doing is really trying to push the limits of what would be possible in this mode. At the same time, we also identify some data sets where GPT-3's few-shot uh, learning still struggles, as well as some data sets where GPT-3 faces methodological issues related to training on large web corpora. I also love this sentence. It's again very open about what they achieved and where the limitations are. They're acknowledging that they found some tasks that are still hard for the model, and they also acknowledge in the paper that they had some sort of minor slip-ups where they intended to make sure they hadn't trained on data that was relevant for the test task that they were performing. And in fact, they had not quite gotten that right. And so they're being very open about that and kind of exploring how hard it is to get that right at the scale that they're operating at. So just like the GPT-2 paper, a wonderfully open and thorough exploration uh, of the ideas.